Good afternoon. I'm Paul Jaffe. I'm from the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. I am engaged in the prototyping effort of a component that has technology relevant to space solar power. And I'm going to talk to you today about the status of our research and to discuss, discuss some of the analyses and trades that we've done in the process of uh, the execution of the research. So for those of you who are not familiar with space solar power, basically, as you've heard from the previous speaker, it involves the collection of sunlight and space and sending it wirely, wirelessly to the ground. There's a number of different ways it could be done. As you heard, you can use microwaves or lasers as a means to transmit the power to the ground. One scheme that has been proposed that John was just talking about is this integrated or modular symmetrical concentrator concept. Uh, you can see pictured on the lower corner here. It involves concentrating the sunlight using reflectors and then a secondary mirror to direct the sunlight onto an array of sandwich modules. And the sandwich modules consist of uh, you'll you'll see it shortly, but they consist on the top of a layer of photovoltaics in the middle of a layer that converts the DC output of the photovoltaics to microwave frequencies and then on the bottom an antenna. And the advantage of this approach is that it means you don't have to deal with the concentrated power that you might have seen in the earlier proposals from the late 70s and 80s where you had a massive photovoltaic array and then you needed a slip ring or some other device that would handle a tremendous amount of current to be sent to the microwave transmission antenna. So this endeavors to get away from that, avoids the higher levels of uh, concentrated electrical power. Uh, and by, by way of introduction to this, that there are a number of different architectures that have been examined. PV is the one we've been talking about most today so far, but certainly others have proposed using solar thermal means where you'd have essentially a large heat engine that would drive a, a generator. The, some of the Japanese work is also focused on lasers that are actually pumped by the sun. And in addition to microwave and lasers, you could also just have a large reflector in space that would just reflect the sunlight. And there's been some, some efforts used uh, to uh, investigate that. So I've, I spoke about the uh, symmetrical concentrator approach there, and you can see the microwaves are sent to Earth from the bottom of the sandwich array. Now, one thing inherent in the integrated and modular symmetrical concentrator approaches is, is this idea of using concentration. And there are a few motivations to use concentration. Uh, one is that solar cells are actually more efficient under concentrated sunlight. It also means if you can get two suns worth out of the same area, you're reducing the total amount of solar uh, cell area that you need. And this, in turn, translates into the potential to reduce mass. One of the major economic objections to space solar power is that you just have to put a tremendous amount of mass into space. And concentration reduces that mass by whatever level your concentration factor is. And also, in the case of the integrated symmetrical concentrator, the reflectors help redirect the energy, which before you might have had to send over a possibly not very reliable slip ring handling uh, thousands of amps of current. Now, it's of course not without disadvantages. The principal one is the thermal concentrated sunlight multiplies your whatever thermal problems you already have by the level of concentration. And it does require additional structure. So certainly not a uh, perfect solution. So here's a schematic of the sandwich module. Like I mentioned, you got the photovoltaics on top where the sunlight comes in, concentrated or not, and some means of converting from the DC output of the photovoltaics to the RF frequency. You need to send it to the ground, and that can be done in a number of ways, which I'll discuss. And then finally, the antenna elements that send the microwaves to the ground. People have been working on this for quite some time. Uh, you can see these two distinguished gentlemen in our audience today, uh, John Menkins and Nobukaya. Uh, they made a prototype some, some time ago, you can see here. Also, uh, Hiroshi Matsumoto at Kyoto University back in 2001 made a, uh, a model as well. And there have been a number of analyses that have been done over the years related to this concept as well. Our goal with the research was to produce a prototype that we would then test under realistic environmental conditions. So 
where I work at the Naval Research Lab, we have been doing satellites since the 1950s, and we have a uh, our whole satellite integration facility. We built the first GPS satellites, and we have a lot of experience doing things in space and testing spaceflight hardware. So our interest is definitely in bringing some of these concepts a little closer to actual space quality hardware. The trade studies we've done roughly correlate to the layers of the sandwich module. I'll also discuss some of the structural trades that we've done. And because the thermal is so important, we have done quite a large number of thermal analyses at this point. And I'll give you an overview of some of the enveloping cases that kind of show where the limits of the concentration are. All right, since we have a four-year effort and we're about a year and a half into it, and by the end of that four years, we not only have to have constructed a prototype, but actually tested it, we are limited to kind of what we can buy now. Like you may hear about results from labs where they've gotten 40% or better solar cell efficiency, but in general, those are very small area photocells under many hundreds of suns of concentration. But we need to work with something we can actually buy pretty much today. And that brings us down back to about 30%. And if we use space qualified photovoltaics, the sources are fairly limited pretty much to MCOR and Spectrolab, which have comparable offerings. So that's uh, very likely to be what we will use for our photovoltaics layer. We also have some uh, surplus solar panels from another project kicking around that are not quite as highly efficient, but because we have so many of them and we can kind of do whatever we want with them, there may be a low cost prototyping option there. The middle layer of the sandwich, the DC to RF conversion, there are a number of different options for this. Uh, some of the notable ones are magnetrons, like you would find in your everyday microwave oven. They have a long uh, history in production. Uh, solid state power amplifiers, which have seen a number of technology gains recently with uh, gallium nitride technology. Traveling wave tubes, which have been used in space for quite a while. And then multiple beam klystrons, a little bit of a wild card. They have been used in space on Mir and in other contexts, but in general, the Technolo technology advancement there has not been uh, the, uh, the same magnitude as other areas. So each of them has advantages and disadvantages. You can see they've got uh, kind of a variety of, of efficiencies. One nice thing about the solid state power amplifiers is that the input voltage they require is dramatically less than the vacuum electronics options. And that makes them attractive because you don't have to add a, another piece of your sandwich, which would be the conversion of the low voltage DC output you get from the photovoltaics to the high voltage that a vacuum electronics conversion scheme would require. So because of this, we've been focusing mostly on the solid state power amplifiers. And this is a rough schematic, actually, at this point, it's, it's uh, somewhat out of date. Uh, one aspect of the solid state power amplifiers is they don't have a tremendous amount of gain. So if you want to get from a RF signal to a signal that's actually large enough in power magnitude that you would want to transmit it to the Earth, you need a pretty big chain of solid state power amplifiers, each adding gain with its own stage. So uh, that's the approach we've been taking so far. And here's our, uh, our test setup. We are using these devices from Cree. Uh, we actually switched recently from using 5.8 gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz because we can get more efficient devices at the lower frequency. Uh, but you can see the prototype board that we got and our characterization set up and we verified that their performance data is what is stated and we can operate them in a number of different uh, biasing conditions. And this is some of the data we collected. A little bit about the multiple beam klystrons. Because we do have a very active vacuum electronics group at NRL, we are looking into the multiple beam klystron option. It's probably not a near-term option. It's very unlikely that it would end up in a prototype that we would produce in the near term. But nonetheless, just because some of the uh, theoretical specific powers are quite high, it is worth looking into. Uh, the antenna trade we've largely deferred just because it's going to be much more of a challenge to get the thermal design to close probably than it would be to design an antenna since there are many different options. All right, a couple things about the physical configuration. If you look in the literature, 
Most of the sandwich modules you'll see depicted have a hexagonal shape, and we went in thinking that seems like a, a reasonable shape. It's good for tessellating. It fits nicely in a launch vehicle fairing. Uh, but as we looked at farther, we realized that it had a number of drawbacks that probably made the square option more attractive. One you can see straight from the pictures that if you're using rectangular photovoltaics, which we certainly will be doing for this prototype, you have a lot of gaps where now you have surface that you're not using to convert the sunlight. Uh, the other thing is with launch vehicles, they obviously have a specific payload fairing volume, and they also have a mass limit of what they can put into orbit for you. And it turns out, unless you have extraordinarily lightweight and low density sandwich modules, you're going to hit that mass limit long before you'll hit the volume limit. So the slightly less efficient packing you get out of the square modules is kind of not important compared with the, uh, the hexagonal ones, which use the space a little better. Here's just a CAD drawing of our, one of our uh, module concepts and some of the internals with the solid state power amplifier chains inserted. All right, about that thermal problem I was talking about. You're limited fundamentally by the radiative heat transfer equation, and it's dependent on the emissivity of your material, the temperature, the area, and the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And by looking at this, you can figure out kind of the, the limitations you have just from physics on concentration. One way to think about this is by taking an actual concrete example. So we assumed a 28 by 28 centimeter square module, so about like that. And we said, all right, at one sun, knowing what we know about the efficiencies of the devices we can get, what do you end up with? So that area intercepts about 100 watts of sunlight. Some of that gets reflected since the solar cells are not perfectly absorptive. The most inefficient link in the chain is the solar cells, so you get most of the heat that needs to be dissipated from them. We were kind of optimistic on our DCRF conversion efficiency. None of the SSPAs we're looking at actually make it there, and certainly the chains would be less. And then the antennas are pretty efficient, but you still end up with about a 23% combined module efficiency, meaning that of that 100 watts or so you're getting in, about 75 of that has to be dissipated. And that's just at one sun for this area. So we said, let's take a look at the concentration cases. Now, if you think back for a moment to the radiative heat equation, uh, the most emissive you can be is if you're a black body. So we said, we'll assume that. Turns out you can actually get reasonably close to that if you use graphite or certain kinds of anodized aluminum. Uh, but what this plot is showing is the amount of area required as a function of the number of suns to maintain of any of these temperatures. So if you look at the purple line, if you say we can operate at 200 degrees C, which is quite hot, most electronics want to be probably less than half of that, and you're a perfect emitting black body, then you can get up to about five suns if you are able to use both sides of that 28, 28 centimeter on an edge square module uh, using both sides as radiators. And if you take a kind of a more realistic case, say uh, anodized aluminum, meaning maintaining 100 degrees C, you start topping out around two suns using both sides. And it's true the solar cells themselves are not terrible in terms of their, uh, their emissivity, but, uh, but you can see like you're very unlikely to get up to 10 suns or anything higher than that. So you can look at this another way, if I can get the uh, chart to change there. There we go. Uh, also as a function of the number of suns, maybe you can design electronics that are able to function at really high temperatures. So that 200 degree C line, that brown line we were looking at, or I guess it was a purple line, uh, maybe that slope can be a little bit lower. And of course, the amount of heat you have to dissipate is driven by the total module efficiency. So the one we were looking at at first was 23. You can make kind of more optimistic or realistic assumptions. In terms of the photovoltaics, you're going to be bound probably by the shockley Quistler, Quistner limit, which I think is about 80% even under perfect conditions with an infinite, infinite number of band gaps. Uh, 
But again, here, like even if you make that very optimistic assumption and you say uh, your devices are happy at 100 degrees C, you're unlikely to get into the 10 sun range. It's much more realistic to be in the one, two, or three sun range. We did model a number of different configurations. These are all very much the uh, flat sandwich modules like the previous speaker spoke about. Uh, we added different structures on there to try to increase the area. We reduced the coverage of the photocells to add radiator area and reduce the heat generated by the conversion inefficiency. And none of them really solved the problem. Uh, fundamentally, you're having to make a trade-off between the concentration and your radiator, radiator area. One thing I, I should mention, and it's implicit in all of the previous discussion, is that we want these modules to essentially be self-sufficient in terms of the heat they can reject. If you do something like the space station where you have large areas of radiators that are solely for getting rid of the excess heat, it's a completely different story, but something like that is a lot harder to scale. It's a lot less likely to be modular because now you have to transfer heat between modules and get it from the center to a, uh, a distant point on the edge. Uh, but basically, we're looking at departing from the flat module approach just to get more area. And uh, the other side is you can reduce the concentration and then just try to make your sandwich modules as low density as possible. Uh, as we move forward, uh, we're still working on a actual a final module design and ordering some of the parts. Once we actually get a prototype fabricated, we'll start doing our testing on that. And certainly, I'm always interested in hearing people's comments and feedback, looking for uh, things we, we've missed or holes in our reasoning. And I am. Uh, Happy to be here today to tell you a little about a bit, little bit about what we're doing and and get your feedback. So thank you for that. I understand the twenty five watt system, but when you scale it up to multi megawatt system, a how do you propose launching it? How do you uh, assemble it and all this? Yeah, I mean these are great questions, right? Like. We, because we have pretty limited resources, we had to bite off like a small manageable piece. Like it's very easy with the space solar power implementations to kind of chase yourself because by changing one parameter here, you radically alter the impact of another parameter. So we said, all right, let's, we, we don't have the time or resources to do a full on system design, which ultimately would need to be done for a real system. Let's take a look at this one possible component, look at the limitations, define the boundaries, so that when you do go to design that ultimate system, you're not trying to do something that ends up being crazy, like saying, oh, we'll get 100 suns so that we can reduce our PV area to some tiny amount. Uh, do you know approximately how much the radiators, like say the graphene, uh, weigh per square meter? We have some data on that. Uh, for now, they're probably not going to be the heaviest component. Like the antennas, well, certainly the PV. Like even if you use like the thin film with the substrate ground away, those still have those will probably still be heavier than the radiators, as would the antenna. So I didn't really go through the whole story of how this research came to be funded. Uh, it it traces back to the NSSO report from 2007 that you may be familiar with. Uh, that attracted the attention of the leadership at the lab, and we actually did an internal technical report, which is on the NSSS website. It's about 100 pages, uh, really takes a hard look at a lot of the technology. And uh, from that, me and some other folks at the lab who did work on the report put forth this as a way to address one of the technology areas. And I should point out that the sandwich module is usable in other contexts besides space solar power. So even if space solar power never really pans out, there's other areas where you might want to use a sandwich module that does sunlight to RF conversion. We've looked at a number of novel heat 
uh, transfer mechanisms. One of the areas of research we have at the lab are these diamond substrates, which are very good at heat spreading. We've uh, looked at the pyrolytic graphite, which I guess has been around for quite some time. And there's really, depending on how crazy you want to get, like there's these sheet flow radiators, which are tremendously efficient, but would be probably very challenging to apply to this kind of configuration. There's microchannel heat spreaders as well. So we have been looking at those, but in general, most of those are for moving the heat around rather than the actual heat rejection, which you would have to do at some point. of the solid state power amplifiers. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not an expert on that. I, I know the ones that we're looking at, the 5.8 gigahertz ones, are about 60% uh, drain efficiency. And our testing showed... Oh, well, one thing you should be, like there's not, I don't think there's an analog to Moore's law exactly with the solid state power amplifier efficiency. They are getting more efficient, certainly like with the GAN technology and the GAN crystal growth, that's been advancing a lot. But uh, I, I don't think it's reasonable to extrapolate from the current path right now. But it's, it's not my field. We, we have folks at NRL who that's all they do is solid state devices, and they could probably answer that better. All right, thank you. So that, that, uh, that concludes our second session. Uh, we're on track uh, for, uh, we're a few minutes late. There's evidently coffee and light snacks available someplace probably uh, out at, the, uh, at the, the arsenal, or at least it'll feel like you've walked to the arsenal if you go to get one, get a snack. Yeah, exactly. We're going we're gonna to pause for a few moments, and in about uh, six, seven minutes, we'll start our third uh, session. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, in the third session, we're going to hear about a novel uh, solar uh, power uh, architecture. Uh, and some uh, other uh, wireless power transmission experiments that have been ongoing in Japan. So that'll, that'll get started in about uh, five, six minutes. Finally, do what they're supposed to do. How will it be? 
how will it be available? And if somebody asks me, where can I read Mr. Mankin's book on solar power? You get it from the academy. You can get it from the academy. Exactly. It's not going to be a sale at, at Borders or Amazon or no, a place like that. So <laughs> it's the International Academy of Astronauts, right. and they, set, they, they have a website where you can order exactly. things by phone exactly. from them. Although I have to say that, that since it's been almost a year since most of the work was done, and actually uh, already started working on a popular version of the book that would uh, restructure it a bit and make it more of a readable book and less of a, um, of a like a National Research Council report. Mm -hmm. So a little more emphasis on the technical, a little less emphasis on the policy recommendations. And that's but something that in, uh, in future years might be. One year, one year. One another, another because year. it works okay. all yeah. It's just a question of going in and re-editing it. Because, I mean, you have done so much work and you have such a wealth of knowledge on the subject, it would be great to make it available for folks who are interested in their folks interested and everywhere, but particularly with energy prices going up, it's a good time to look at... I live in Washington State. I mean, there we had a popular initiative that required this, uh, the power companies to purchase increasing amounts of power from renewable energy sources every year, which is beginning to bite now, which, you know, they... There's a downside to that too, because that power is three or four times as expensive as exactly. hydroelectric power. But it also makes, I don't know what your conclusions are, what the cost of solar power eventually would be, but it makes that less unachievable if the baseline for commercially available power is four, four times as high as it was five years ago, it makes, makes solar power exactly less, right. less unaffordable. So. Well, and in 1997, when we did the pressure study, the price of a barrel of oil was uh, $20. Right. And today it's about $100. And, and it, it makes the uh, both the perception and the reality uh, a lot uh, a lot better. So, okay, well, anyway. I'm looking forward to reading. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to introduce you to one of my students. Yes. How have you been? I'm here. This is Grant. This is this is this is this is, this is the the John Mann. You know, when we talk about that guy, all the good things they say about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> So you're you're managing. You're still kind. You're still you know, working with this. Wonderful. Good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is. Are you chairing this coming session on space solar power? Oh, I, I, I'm chairing oh, okay. this in total. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you're okay. You sit in.
because it lets you get to let you get to something like that. And they go on. And they go on. And you never know how to do If we could reconvene here in just a moment, please. Jaffe san. Fujita san. Sunu san. I hope everyone was able to go and get uh, coffee and a snack. Maybe not. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we are ready to reconvene uh, with our third session. Um, uh, this afternoon, we'll be hearing from uh, Tom Taylor uh, with uh, Exploration Partners, LLC, about the Rainbow Solar Receiver, and afterwards from uh, Professor uh, Nobu Kikaya of Kobe University uh, concerning some um, uh, concepts for uh, wireless power transmission experiments and some recent experience. So, Tom, please. Each hold your remarks to about 20 minutes, then we have a little time at the end of each talk for some question and discussion. Now, is there something I'd push here that gets it on the screen? No idea. Maybe that? That part I didn't learn. I'm way at the bottom and left, lower left on the screen. Yeah. So, my name is Tom Taylor. I'm an entrepreneur for 33 years. An entrepreneur is a, a little bit different animal than you usually see up here. Can you use the microphone? Yeah. Hello. Sorry about that. Like I said, I have that to learn yet. Uh, entrepreneurs are a little different. Um, but since 1979, I've created my own job. And um, so, you have to keep uh, several irons in the fire. And uh, this is a new concept that we have been exploring at Ex Exploration Partners. Uh, we've been in business for about four years, uh, mostly in um, shuttle activity. Uh, 
We're going to talk about a two cell, higher efficiency, basic concept, which we need to move toward a business uh, as quick as we can. And uh, we're a little bit frustrated by the fact that we've been looking at space solar power for 40 years. And uh, the original Peter Glazer design, uh, I can remember back to the Lincoln conference where uh, we were really excited about uh, space solar power. And I put in a paper and quickly forgot about it. And um, I had a friend of mine call me and say uh, he read it, which doesn't mean much. But other than I'm that old. Um, so we're going to split the. Uh, this one, this. I got it. Um, oh. OK, let me talk a little about the introduction. Well, maybe not. All right. Uh, <laughs> forget the introduction. Uh, basic concept, we're uh, using two different uh, PV cells. Uh, we're bringing in solar radiation. Uh, we're looking at ground systems uh, initially to uh, create some money. And that we uh, then uh, use a, a hot uh, filter, a hot mirror, and a cold mirror to split that, that light frequency to uh, give the cells down there in blue uh, the kind of frequency that they are most appreciate and can create uh, more than uh, normal um, power from. Um, we also then add massive uh, solar concentration. And uh, it looks something like this with the uh, reflectors uh, visible. And um, so as entrepreneurs, we think about the future market, how we sell this thing in the uh, the real world of uh, roofs uh, in New Mexico, for example, or elsewhere in America. And um, we have to then be lower in cost initially and higher in uh, efficiency than the uh, low cost leader, which appears to be Harbor Freight up here in the, in the top. And uh, they get to about $3 a, a watt. Um, so this would be the beginnings of a, of a concept that we're starting to explore. and. Uh, I won't speak any more about the roof uh, uh, tops units, but uh, more about the space unit because uh, basically we're at a space conference. Um, so the energy comes in from the side, and uh, uh, heats uh, it bounces off and heats up this uh, small set of um, uh, PV cells, and um, then it. Uh, generates uh, enough electricity that we have uh, active cooling that, that cools that, and then a large uh, transmitter for uh, transmitting to the ground, to the ground customer. And uh, we have other things that are always inherent on satellites that include uh, propellant tanks and, and all that. Um, we're looking at several designs. This is the same design you've just seen, but in kind of three dimension. And we're looking at um, the possibility of the launch vehicle being part of our radiator system. Because when you get into massive solar concentration like we're, we're envisioning, you end up with a lot of heat. And uh, we need ways of getting rid of that heat. So we're looking uh, to think of a Delta II launch with a um, demonstrator satellite that would um, look something like this, certainly not a final design. But we do think that the, uh, the radiator tanks uh, idea might, might be of benefit for us. Another uh, four reflector system, which would use um, uh, inflatable reflectors that would focus on a, uh, a red X kind of a, um, a receiving device that looks a, about like that uh, with solar cells on these uh, surfaces up and down, and um, we would still use that uh, splitting of the, of the sunlight frequency to, uh, to get to a system that is a bit more complicated when you, yeah. Um, so if you'll go down to the lower left, uh, your lower left corner there, we use a special PV cell 
uh, right here uh, behind this, this mirror and another cell along here. And they then um, add the mirrors that were added here. Uh, and then over on the third corner here, we've got the sunlight coming in, the, the frequency split. And so each cell gets the, the kind of uh, sunlight that it, it does, does best. And then, uh, as you might imagine, we'll be limited by active cooling. So we think that the cooling could be as sophisticated as liquid metal. Um, but uh, when we're looking at massive solar concentration, um, we would expect to go as high as we can go and still actively cool it. So cooling may be the, the limiting factor for us. Uh, this is a rainbow concept. Um, and um, most of you are probably familiar with it. I won't spend a lot of time. But this is a Fresnel lens, sunlight coming in. And there's six solar cells on the side that are, are described here. And they, they get then a, an increase in um, a created or, or uh, the electrical output. So we're always interested in the market and uh, what market might be captured by such a device. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you, you can't pour billions of dollars into something without, without a market that would um, pay back uh, the investors. So we think that the uh, easiest market for us to uh, approach would be the 20 degrees north and south of the equator. And in those regions, we've got uh, underdeveloped countries, mining companies, and other people who basically burn diesel fuel for, uh, for power. Uh, I've lived in some of those areas, and uh, they don't have the sophistication of, of giant power grids and stuff like we have in a developed country. So they're probably um, susceptible to 6 and $8 uh, a gallon diesel, and it could be double or triple that in the, uh, the coming decades. Um, We also make some other changes so that we can actually get a system in orbit as, as, fairly, as fast as we can. So we're really saying that these, these uh, beginning demo satellite would um, actually be down to just under the Van Allen belt, which is probably starts about 900 kilometers up. And um, so we would have the ability to, to raise these satellites once they, they, uh, they come down. We also then would be passing over our customer, uh, customer's rectenna, and we hope uh, electronically steering our, our transmitters so that we can feed them power for 5, 10, 15 minutes while we're over them. And we would do that 12 to 15 times a day. So it's a little different than uh, everybody envisions with the, the units that uh, geostationary. We believe in, in order to get us started, we have to attack some of the barriers that we currently see within the, uh, the space solar power arena. Um, we have reduced the number of vehicles it takes to get to uh, the final use location by, by one trip. Uh, going to GEO, of course, is usually thought of as being assembled in, in low Earth orbit and then uh, transmitted uh, or ion propulsed, uh, propelled up to uh, geostationary. So we've eliminated that geostationary trip we also eliminated the ability to spend billions and never get the first kilowatt out uh, until you've actually spent that money and put it in orbit. Um, we think that we can put together a demo that might deliver electricity to uh, equatorial customers uh, on, as a demo and prove out the concept and get us into a financing scenario that, quite frankly, uses the same financing scenarios and mechanisms that are used in the communications industry today. So we're really in the business of leasing satellites, not necessarily producing power. Our power customer on the ground would be the retail um, electrical seller or that we, that we have in all developed countries. The people that you pay your power bill to would be the guy would be receiving our power. So it's a little bit different than what we normally think of in a developed country. And uh, we expect to make those people uh, wealthy uh, 
by joining us early on. Uh, everybody believes that we need to raise the solar cell efficiently before we can get into um, big time operations in space solar power. We believe that solar concentration, maybe even massive solar concentration, can uh, take the kind of cells that we can get out of the lab today and uh, with a little bit of innovation make them the, the beginning of, of a different industry. Um, large systems uh, in space solar power also require large rectennas on the ground and fairly large hardware in orbit. We've reduced most of that mass to uh, both on the ground and in, in uh, orbit by changing the method and changing the, the, uh, the way we do things. Um, also, it has an effect on many other things. Um, big rectennas and, and all of the power coming down to one location also requires a power grid. Uh, and um, what we've uh, done here is uh, reduce some of that. Now, about a year and a half ago, we did a study that uh, looked at the manned shuttle arrive vehicle, which of course now is thought to be uh, dead and buried, although uh, there are some indications that's not true. Um, and so we did a little bit of work on what we could do with the space shuttle if we uh, modernized it a bit. We used the old hardware, but used it in a new way. We uh, also have been working with some of the shuttle arrive people and advocates that are are still in the government. And um, we came up with this concept for a uh, larger space solar power unit. And uh, here's the long kind of uh, mechanisms. They're in inflatable, uh, inflatable structures that really put together and come up with something like this. The, uh, the inflatable structure you saw is really this, this, and this. All the way around, we leave the tank in there because we expect to use that as a radiator. Um, and the uh, vehicle uh, payload came up in this particular vehicle. Uh, if we become sophisticated, we might take the engines back to Earth, but uh, for right now, we don't worry about it. So this is the, uh, the hemisphere, the half a circle here that, that heats up these uh, solar, solar cells. Uh, of course, you need active cooling, but it, this becomes a fairly large uh, facility in orbit. It would, again, be under the Van Allen belt, and because it's so big and bulky, it would probably re-enter without additional uh, re reboost propellant in about 11 years. Um, the external tank unaided has been looked at about going to orbit, and at 300 nautical miles, it will uh, re-enter in about 11 years. So. This is big and bulky, but what happens is that it's uh, got some natural uh, issues as well. Uh, if you've got the sun coming in from the, uh, the right, uh, you've got some of these uh, different areas excited by the, the uh, sunlight. Uh, the Earth, of course, here is in the center, but you also have the external tank, which, because it has some foam on it, will go to, to bright metal in about a year uh, to 18 months in orbit just by spalling off. So that would become our radiator. There's actually two, two tanks of 19,000 cubic feet here and another 53,000, 54,000 cubic feet of internal volume that we would use. And uh, we've been thinking about what kind of radiator that might, might make for us. Um, but also uh, it's, uh, fair to say that you'd, you'd need to have the, uh, the radiation to the blackness of space. And this whole long body, which is about 200 feet long in orbit, would rotate 360 degrees on every orbit. And it would be going around the Earth about 12 to 15 times a day. So we're still radiating down to, to uh, willing customers here and here and here and here. And... Uh, we don't have any basic uh, energy storage here, but because we pass over customers so often in the day, we expect their facility on the ground would have uh, new flywheels or whatever it would take for storage of the power. So we've changed the thinking a little, 
and in hopes of uh, getting into a, a business as quick as possible, certainly quicker than 40 years. And so I began to look at uh, what the power system in a developed country looks like. And it's uh, kind of like this with a generating station here, uh, an up, uh, a step up transformer, big transmission line, step down transformer, and, and then a th set of three customers here. So our first customer would be a ground solar, which I haven't said much about, but um, uh, that customer could become a, a, a rooftop kind of customer. And then we ask ourselves, where do we plug into that existing system in a well-developed country without creating a lot of uh, competition and a lot of people who are angry? Because um, we're really approaching everything from the coal mines to the generating station and the step up and transmission lines step down, we think we could enter here like space solar power people do now and all of that would be used by, by the large uh, geostationary power plants. But we would prefer to enter here and serve these three customers with a smaller rectenna because we're closer to Earth and, a, and we're a new green system, and basically the coal mine all the way up to the, uh, to the, to the transformer in here somewhere uh, are industries that are no longer required for our system. So it has some impact economically, and that's kind of what we look for as entrepreneurs. So the future, if we're able to get this kind of innovation into uh, into use in orbit will eventually drive our, our uh, species off the planet into uh, other adventures around the solar system. But we're basically saying go back to the sun uh, and quit using the, the re renewable resources that have been stored on our planet, uh, and which originally came from the sun as well. Um, and then we think America as an innovation leader needs to be that nation that does that, use that innovation to uh, create a new system. And uh, we think that's part of the payback that taxpayers get for supporting the space program for 60 years. So that's it. Thank you. something like this, uh, and it will eliminate industries in the developed countries, like the big power grid will no longer be fully required, the coal mine won't be required, the generating system won't be required, and so we think our best market would be in an underdeveloped country, where none of those, those angry competitors would exist and, and kill a young venture like So we would sell to new customers, new, new people that are selling retailing uh, electric power in underdeveloped countries. We believe that would be our first market. So I mean, it's wild thinking, but that's it. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I am a Novikaya from Kobe University. 
So uh, we are developing a, a microwave power transmission. So I want to, uh, I would like to uh, talk about our current and uh, uh, research. So uh, we are developing a, a sandwich uh, uh, solar power satellite. Uh, we are proposing uh, uh, this uh, type of the uh, solar power satellite in 1995. So, and uh, uh, you can understand uh, uh, these, uh, we have uh, two, uh, a pair of uh, reflector, and uh, uh, this is a, a sandwich structure. Uh, on the uh, one side, uh, solar cell, on the opposite side, uh, uh, microwave power transmitter. So, and uh, uh, solar energy are reflected twice and uh, concentrated on the solar uh, cells, and uh, uh, electricity are generated by the solar cells and uh, converted to the microwave to the ground. So uh, John's, my, uh, John's idea is uh, very similar. Uh, so, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, we are, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you can understand the uh, uh, reflector is a very huge uh, maybe uh, uh, it uh, required to be a uh, uh, diameter of uh, five kilometer, and uh, transmit antenna must be uh, uh, over one kilometer, too huge. So, and uh, but uh, we have to reduce the weight of the uh, sandwich structure. So uh, maybe a uh, uh, structure mu must be uh, flexible. So uh, uh, microwave transmitter uh, antenna. We've looked at a number of novel heat uh, transfer mechanisms. One of the areas of research we have at the lab are these diamond substrates, which are very good at heat spreading. We've uh, looked at the pyrolytic graphite, which I guess has been around for quite some time. And there's really, depending on how crazy you want to get, like there's these sheet flow radiators, which are tremendously efficient, but would be probably very challenging to apply to this kind of configuration. There's microchannel heat spreaders as well. So we have been looking at those, but in general, most of those are for moving the heat around rather than the actual heat rejection, which you would have to do at some point. Of the solid state power amplifiers? Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not an expert on that. I, I know the ones that we're looking at, the 5.8 gigahertz ones, are about 60% uh, drain efficiency. And our testing showed. Oh, well, one thing you should be like, there's not, I don't think there's an analog to Moore's Law exactly with the uh, solid state power amplifier efficiency. They are getting more efficient, certainly, like with the GAN technology and the GAN crystal growth that's been advancing a lot. But uh, I, I don't think it's reasonable to extrapolate from the current path right now. But it's, it's not my field. We, we have folks at NRL who that's all they do is solid state devices, and they could probably answer that better. All right. Thank you.